This week on the Stoia Geeks, we interview Fred Rui from Nomad Cigar Company in Debonair Ideal. We're going to talk about cigars to give out at a wedding. Stogie Santa will join us for Stogies of the Week, and Lord knows what to expect. All that and more, so stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the Stogie Geek Show. Every new blend borrows from the past in the Saga Blend Number 7. It is a perfect combination of timeless knowledge of traditional tobaccos and the newer balance that today's cigar enthusiasts come to expect and love in a fine cigar. Leveraging six generations of experience and tradition of the Reyes family, the Saga Blend Number 7 delivers a unique, full-flavored, medium-bodied cigar. The cigar is highlighted by a Brazilian wrapper over a blend of Central American and Dominican tobacco. Available in three sizes at an affordable price, the Saga Blend Number 7 is sure to please and bring together past and present. From the makers of the number one cigar in the U.S. in 2013, the Aging Room Quattro F55 comes yet another highly rated cigar, the Aging Room Bin Number 1. The Aging Room Bin Number 1 is a full-body Dominican cigar with some of the world's oldest tobacco on the market today. From the harvest of 1997, 98, and 99, the Aging Room Bin Number 1 starts out smooth and builds up in strength and flavor until it reaches its full potential. The Aging Room Bin Number 1 is for the true cigar connoisseur looking for a sophisticated smoking experience with balance, complexity, and character. Aging Room Cigars. Blending is in our DNA. Partagas, since its introduction in 2014, Partagas 1845 Extra Fuerte has won critical acclaim and a devoted legion of fans. Flawless construction and full-bodied flavor are the hallmarks of this rich, dimensional cigar that features prevalent notes of wood and coffee. Made with a unique blend spanning three continents, Partagas 1845 Extra Fuerte is the perfect choice for any cigar smoking occasion. Havana Cigar Club, located in Warwick, Rhode Island, is a great place to enjoy a drink and a cigar. Stogie Geeks listeners can find a $5 off coupon on our website by clicking the HCC logo. Welcome everyone to the Stogie Geeks show. This is episode, wait for it, 165. That's right, it's Thursday, November 19th, 2015. I have to look these things up because I don't necessarily pay attention especially when I get busy in my day job doing things like writing code, <laughs> I, I'd lose track of what sure. what day no is it. Problem. And then I get home and I have to wrangle kids. So, you that, know, you live in that another, utopian that, that's Yeah, I, like I get home and it's just a blur until yeah. it's like, oh, my God, it's 11 o'clock at night. I have, I have to especially to, at their age. I have to have a cigar <laughs> and go to bed. <laughs> right. <laughs> With me in studio is Mr. Jeff Mann. Mr.? Mister? You've been mixing some I've been cocktails. mixing some good <laughs> drinks. <laughs> <laughs> We're like Who knew? 60 <laughs> seconds into the show and I'm slurring my speech. Or it's because Stokey said it. I always slur my speech when you're here. Dude. What is, is the, I don't know if it's because we drink so much or because... Uh, I, it's I just your know. presence. We're, we're just intoxicated it makes on me all, nicotine. That's makes what it me is. all fluster. <laughs> 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 Holy shit! <laughs> uh, Jeff, have you have you been on the Story Geek show before? This you is my said, first time. Is it your first time? Yeah. It'll be your last. Yeah. It, <laughs> Jeff and I worked I together. I've got a job at the bar, though. <laughs> That's right. There you go. <laughs> Jeff and I work together in our day jobs, mm-hmm. and Jeff comes here and helps us out with the Security Weekly podcast. Mm-hmm. Jeff is a cigar enthusiast. I am. I said that without slurring my speech. <laughs> <laughs> enthusiast. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm glad to have you here, Jeff. Yeah. And uh, you've, you've been known to come here to the studio and smoke my cigars. Which I have. It's welcome. I have a lot of cigars to smoke, and I'm happy to share them uh, mm, and I with the it. fellow brother of the leaf. So, there you go. Uh, Mr. Stogie Santa Good is here in studio. Wonderful Good to, to be have back. you, Stogie Santa. And you've already had influence on the show <sighs> because you came in and you're like, uh, I'm going to smoke this. Is that is that what we're smoking? I'm like, yes, yes. that is what we're smoking. Mm-hmm. So we're smoking the Debonair A size in the Maduro wrapper. Is that mm-hmm. correct? Correct. Uh, which is fantastic. And I'm on the training model. You no you well you're on uh, that's Phil's new model you okay. taking the band off okay that's okay uh, Indian motorcycle in the natural robusto is what you're smoking Jeff 
um, which is, a, is from the same manufacturer, Mr. Phil Zangi of Debonair Cigars. So we're kind of having a, a Debonair moment here. Mm-hmm. So when set. is it appropriate to take the wrapper off? I typically... You never take the wrapper off. Never take the wrapper off. No, don't take the wrapper off unless you're going to put a new one on before you smoke it. Right. You take the band off. The band. Yeah, whenever you feel like it. The rabel. It is really. The (laughs) rabel. You take the rabel off. (laughs) (laughs) Well, usually when it gets close to the rabel... And it heats up and it loosens up the glue. That's the theory. I don't know how much weight there is behind that theory. On the lines via Skype, Mr. Theory himself, Mr. Will Cooper. Welcome, Will. Hey, greetings. Glad to be back. Yeah, we missed you last week, dude. You were uh, doing uh, wedding stuff, is that it? Doing wedding stuff, yeah. Yeah, nice. Wow. Congratulations on uh, your daughter getting married, yes. Thank you. This is the wedding cigar. I haven't smoked the wedding cigar yet. Yeah. yeah, Will had a I'm wedding actually cigar. smoking a Nomad Therapy right now with our guest, but uh, oh, the wedding that's... cigar. Did you send me some Nomad Therapies? Because I couldn't find any. Yes. You did? Yes. Is that what I should be smoking? Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. I asked you that before the show. <laughs> yeah, it but then late. you showed. <laughs> I asked you. I said I'd like to. Fr- I, Fred must have sent something up. You did what not say. <laughs> you said fuck Fred. <laughs> I, I heard him <laughs> say that. <laughs> I, I heard it clear and simple. <laughs> On the lines via Skype is Mr. Fred Rui. <laughs> Fred, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. Uh, <laughs> I don't blame right. you, dude. I'm. S- uh, at least, I, go ahead. I apologize. You should. <laughs> <laughs> Bad influence, Mr. Soga Santa, is on me. Oh, yeah. Fred, welcome to the show. Welcome back to Thank the you. show, I, sh- I should Thank say. You. Uh, yeah. you were like interview number one. Was it interview number one on the yes. show? Episode uh, three. Yes, yeah, something early early on, and then like 80 or 90 or I don't know. I, I 63, don't really Will is saying. You were the hell, first. If you don't know, why the hell would I know? Well, I mean, he was 63, really. and I think then he was 111, but you missed that show, Paul. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, well, by oh, the that's way, why it's a good show. Sense, now I remember. Do you okay, yeah. a trend going <laughs> I remember, on? I remember that being Missed the show, the doesn't show. bring the cigar. Oh, wow. I've, I've heard about that episode. That yeah. was like the best the episode. The best episode was the one I didn't make it. Well, it's the it's the Stogie Geeks Lost episode. I mean, it's the one everybody talks about. Yeah. So uh, I get it. It's, it's only on the Christmas DVD. And uh, yeah, it was a good time. <laughs> <laughs> we should make a Christmas DVD. That would be awesome. Oh, oh yeah. And, friend, you're like into marketing, dude. You, uh, you're the, you have a marketing background. Is that true? I do. I do. I, I actually own a marketing company because God knows you couldn't make money just off of cigars starting out for a while. So, uh, yeah, that's what my background is or ended up being by default because we were always initially uh, just, just for 2000 trying to, you know, for whatever endeavor we were in, we'd, you know, hire people and it cost a lot of money. And I'm like, well, hell, I could learn this. So, uh, uh, just started delving into marketing and the kind of psycholo- psychology. I, see, I haven't even got anything. <laughs> so what are you drinking over there, Fred? What's your excuse? <laughs> actually, I ha- I actually had just have water. Believe it or not, I, <laughs> so you need to drink in, something, and you'll speak. I do. I was I was in uh, Vegas last week, and then went to Phoenix. And um, I don't think I have allergies, but whatever hit me when I was in Phoenix uh, the last couple of days. Uh, was just absolutely killing me. Well, so of nothing, course I'm lighting up a cigar and having one. Phoenix. So. Too, too much time in a desert client, uh, climate. Yeah, it might be <laughs> the dry air. Well, why yeah. do you laugh at every time I <laughs> say something wrong? Oh, <laughs> I'm just getting warmed up. All right. <laughs> hey, when does the show start? <laughs> I think we started uh, at episode 63 and haven't really stopped since <laughs> then. So, um, so uh, Fred. Uh, I wanted to ask you a couple of things. Oh, first of all, what I wanted to say, we were talking about this before the show, briefly, your Facebook page. It's you hilarious. should follow Fred on it Facebook is. because it is awesome. It is awesome. I love the one with Jeff Bridges. That was the best oh, one. Oh, dude, the stuff you post on Facebook is epic. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I just, I just find stupid stuff, you know. I mean, um, you know, sometimes I'll have to, like, jump into Photoshop and make something myself. But um, for the most part, I'm just... People send me stuff now, like they'll they'll just email go, oh, Fred, you really should post this, and I'm like, oh, that's actually pretty cool. I, you know, I'll share it yeah. later or something like that. So, um, I guess it's just like this. You know, um, I, I've become like the George Takai of of the cigar world for that, just sharing really cool stuff. 
You um, have. Which I, I don't know if I you're think quite actually, George. If you really want to find somebody, if you really want to follow somebody, follow him because yeah, he finds yeah. way cooler stuff than I do. I don't know if you're quite George Takai level, but you're you're up there. No, you're no, no, there. no, no. Of our cigar world, nobody is his level. Yeah, I, <laughs> I met George this summer actually in Vegas. Did you? I was having dinner and he was at the table right next to us. It was pretty epic. Did you slur he's, your words? He's when he's you probably <laughs> we were drinking at the restaurant, so I probably did. He was probably who is that crazy white guy slurring his words? Um, uh, but yeah, definitely check out Fred's uh, Facebook page. The the train that I like, Fred, is like that period of time where are, are you married? I am. Okay, it, but your wife was uh, away, and you had some like I, bachelor time. <laughs> like like I had a it week, was I had like a week like the, when the mice yeah. are away, the cats will play. And Fred was like, "Yeah, yeah. I'm a, the stuff you were posting that week, dude. I was in <laughs> it stitches. Was epic, yeah. <laughs> it was it was the uh, hashtag. You're not the boss of me." Uh, is what it was. So I was, I, I had, I had literally been on the road, no lie, for like 38 days or something. And I was supposed to stay and be with my wife and daughter. And I'm like, I have got to go home. I have got to get some eye time. So I was just post, I mean, I was, I was eating pizza rolls, ordering pizza two thirty in the morning. Um, just most of it was food related, oddly enough. Uh, just watching stupid movies. I mean, it, it was actually a pretty fun week, but uh, I kept putting it all online, which that seems to be everybody's favorite week because they couldn't get away with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember. Um, I remember that you also did a contest. You actually took that concept, then you put it into a contest for your brand, which I thought was brilliant, actually. Actually, um, Cigar Dojo did. I hadn't even oh. thought about it, and they they I had an interview coming up the following week or the week after. And so they put out a contest that said, um, based on on my my doing that for a week, they had the hashtag "You're not the boss of me," and everybody was supposed to take a picture uh, of of them being, you know, their own their own boss, if you will. And it was pretty funny. <laughs> I didn't think to do a contest of it. They did, and it was actually pretty good. Nice. Uh, now, Fred, when you've come on the show and other interviews that you've done, uh, you're very forthcoming with, "Hey, look, I make cigars, but I'm not, a, you know." The twelfth generation, you know, Cuban farmer of tobacco. Uh, you know, I just I, I I blend cigars, but you know, it's not. I didn't learn cigars when I was four years old, kind of thing. Um, it, it, tell us about that and how that kind of evolved into you doing your own blending seminar, which the title definitely lends itself to uh, my background. It's hacking the blend. Yeah, I'm actually um, I'm actually changing that now. I'm I'm going to actually just become a real jerk and go with attitude. So, um, yeah, I'm not going <laughs> to be forthcoming with, with the it. hacking yeah, culture. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm working on my Dominican pose, which is... Oh, it's very nice. I like, <laughs> I like that. Yeah, yeah, the, the key's in the lower lip, actually. No, so I wanted to do... What happened was is that I was in Texas uh, early in the year, like January, and I had a retailer ask me. He said, look, I, I've seen everything about your cigars. I've seen you're doing some neat stuff. I'm going to bring you in. He says, but I've got one question for you. He says, you know, what makes you different than just another white guy with a cigar? And his point being white guy being non-Cuban, non, you know, Latin America, everything else like that. And as a marketing guy, um, that stuck with me almost daily for about a month. Um, it was probably the best question from a retailer going, you know, how am I different? Um, there's a lot of great cigars in the humidor, as I've said. I smoke a lot of them as well. And I thought, you know, how do I differentiate myself? So I thought, well, is there a way that I could take people through the process of what I do? Mm -hmm. So I had just released, by April, I had just released the Esteli Lot 8613. So I had actually called um, Jose Blanco right before, who has a wonderful seminar uh, mm -hmm. where he has the wrapper and they, and they go through the different segments of the wrapper. Yep, you know, I just sat through that uh, the past couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really good. So I, I didn't want to step on his toes, nor would I even have the ability to do what he did. So I came up with the idea of hacking the blend, and I wanted to name it hacking the blend because I didn't want it to be pretentious. I didn't want to say I knew everything, but I wanted to walk people through the process of how I blend cigars, which is really a lot of trial and error and a lot of experimentation. So what I did is I had three small cigars rolled without any wrapper whatsoever. So one of them's only Jalapa, one of them's only Condega Lajero, and one of them's only Ometepe. And what we do in about a 45, 50 minute time frame is we smoke all three of those. And it created a unique experience because a lot of people don't have the chance to try those tobaccos solo. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then we talk about halap. And so basically I walk them through how I hack my way through the blend. And I think everything in half leaves, as I said before, and I'll put together, okay, give me a half leaf of this, half leaf of this, half leaf of this, full leaf of this, half leaf of this. Let's put it all together, put it in a neutral binder and smoke it, no wrapper, and go, well, that sucks. Okay, take that out. That was a bad idea. Um, add a little bit more of this. And so how I hack my way through it, and I have in my mind what are, where a starting point, but it's a lot like cooking. And the other thing that came up really early in the year that helped solidify the seminar is somebody, a retailer, said, well, you know, I'd never be able to blend cigars. And I said, well, you could blend cigars if you get familiar enough with the tobacco, if you don't know it on an individual basis. And so he said, no, I really don't think I could. And I said, well, I said, have you had cornflakes? And he says, yeah. And I said, well, have you had a raw onion? And he says, well, yeah. And I said, well, then I don't need to make a bowl full of raw onions and cornflakes for you to have an idea what it would taste like. That's really the way blending was for me. So the seminar allowed me to take everybody through the individual pieces. I talk about what characteristics I'm looking for each of those tobaccos. And it's just like cooking. And then we finish on the final cigar so that we can see how do the flavors all come together, how do they complement each other, and what wrapper do we choose in the process to go along with that. And it, and it was, it's been a lot of fun. It's been, and, and it helps kind of separate myself a little bit from some of the pack and, you know, that I'm not the guy down there for two days, that I'm down there for a longer period of time. And it, it's gone really, really well. It's interesting, though, in, in blending, uh, and I've been through a few seminars, sometimes the onion and the cornflakes – by themselves will be good. Sometimes together they're horrible, and other times you add a different component to it, and then you have this fabulous meal. And and I think that your title of hacking the blend is certainly uh, it describes that very well because it's all about experimentation. And you know when I went through my Carclot seminar, and he brought us through all the different puros and said you know smoke these two together, and I'm like wow that was horrible, and now add the other, and I'm like wow that was actually good. So it's amazing how you can combine those different types of tobaccos and maybe by themselves they're good or not good, but together when they, you produce the final blend, that's where it all comes together. Yeah, I mean, about, about um, 30 years ago, I went through a seminar in a restaurant that I was running that we were really into wines. And I remember a guy doing a wine seminar that it was a food and wine tasting. And his point was is that you can have a really good wine, but if it was paired with the wrong food, the wine didn't taste as good and vice versa. So his point was is that, you know, if somebody comes and orders whatever the popular wine is, but they don't pair it right, because everybody thinks, well, the wine good, so the, the food must have been horrible because I know this wine's supposed to be good. And so the idea is, is that, you know, those pairings are very important. So when I blend, and I've always kind of had this philosophy at least pretty early on, was that my job is to showcase those tobaccos so they play, they play nice with each other. Um, sometimes you can play something off each other, like exactly like you said, you know, you can have sweet and sour or something like that, but you're trying to go, okay, what am I trying to accomplish? But at the end of the day, they do have to play with each other and pull off that flavor. And, and, and that's the fun part. I love the blending part. So you've, uh, produced cigars from both Dominican and, and Nicaragua. Are you using different factories for that? Yes. Yes. Um, in Nicaragua right now, I'm almost exclusively doing it on AJ Fernandez uh, he's got amazing tobacco, amazing processes. Um, I just find it to be a great relationship as far as what he has access to, the level of professionalism. Um, incredibly happy with, as large as that factory is, the the quality that they're able. You know, one of the things we talk about in the blending seminars, people talk about, you know, uh, you know, what's the most important thing and stuff like that. And, you know, I blend for flavor and then I, then I go to strength, then I go to aroma. And everybody's like, oh, construction. Construction is important. And, yeah, you know, I've heard me, that too. To, to me, construction's a given. Mm -hmm. It should it should be good. Jose Blanco um, says the same thing in his seminar. Yeah, too. yeah. I mean, it's just you know, it, it's it's one of those things that you know you need to have whatever you have in your process to make sure the construction's good. And and so you know, AJ's factory, I never have a problem. Uh, the factory I work with in DR, um, L and B, uh, never have a problem. Um, you know, could I go to other factories? But I'm always apprehensive. Um, I was looking at going to another factory recently, and and I will work with other factories. But it's always the first thing is like, okay, am I going to have to start this part all over again? I know, I, I know you got great tobacco and I know I can get it, but there's that other side that's a given for me. I don't want to worry about construction. I want to focus on the blend, focus on the flavors, and know that it's going to burn right. Sure, it's a, it, sure a man-made product. Sure, you're going to have an issue every once in a while, but I have very rarely have any issues on a burn issue on a Nomad, um, and I'm very proud of that. So, but I think that's because of who I picked to have roll them. Mm. And so are those uh, both puros in their respective countries? Um, no. 
No, I mean like wrappers and stuff a lot of times. Um, so like Connecticut Fuerte was out of DR, uh, but it does have Nicaraguan Lajero. Mm -hmm. um, the, the most recent uh, Lancero that we did is predominantly, you know, the wrapper San Andreas, the filler is predominantly Dominican, but there's a little Nicaraguan in there. On the Nicaraguan side, those end up being predominantly Nicaraguan mm -hmm. um, tobaccos with the exception of the wrappers. A lot of times I'm using an Ecuadorian Habano or something like that in the process. Uh, you mentioned the uh, special Lancero. Is that the H-Town? Yes. So yes. describe that project for our listeners and viewers. Well, it was one that I actually didn't even think that I was going to be involved in. Um, Jorge in, at Stogie's in Houston, uh, World Class Cigars, has an amazing shop. And if you're in Houston, it's certainly worth seeing. I mean, the, the humidor has got to be um, 1,400 square feet. Um, wow. For someone like me, for an actual real stogie geek to go in there, you find stuff buried like, wow, I haven't seen these for a while. And yet, you know, obviously all the most recent stuff. So he announced at one point uh, early that he was going to create uh, 10 Lanceros from 10 different companies. And early in the year, I had met him. And um, he had already, they'd already gone through, I think three of them had been announced. Three of them had been made. And I actually gave him a couple of Lanceros I was playing with. I gave him the Connecticut Forte, which I was getting ready to release. And I gave him another one that I was playing with that actually didn't even start as a Lancero. When I'm playing around with blends, I have a tendency to also say, hey, just roll me some Lanceros. I'm going to lay them down just see how they taste. Um, and I had some of them with me, and I gave them to Jorge. Uh, we were just sitting in the lounge, and I just gave him a couple. said, you know, I'd like to get your opinion on there. Not because I had any thought of even being part of that series, because um, quite honestly, when you look at the list of those people on, the, on that list, I mean, it, it's some big names. Um, it was more so just to get his feedback. I was just kind of curious what he thought because I knew he smoked a lot of Lanceros. And it was probably about a week and a half after I left, I got a phone call and he says, you know, I really want this for the H-Town series. And, uh, and he says, you know, what are your plans for it? And I said, well, I don't really have any plans for it yet. I'm still playing with it. He's like, no, I want it exactly the way it is. He says, it really showcases the San Andreas. So I said, yeah. I mean, I was, I'm like, so I was, just, I was just, like I said, I was just kind of like, you know, felt like I, you know, snuck into the big kids table and no one was making me go back to the other table. So uh, I was pretty happy with that. So was that the first time you played with San Andreas rapper? It is. I'd been playing with the San Andreas for about a year um, or at least nine, ten months because that was kind of the next logical one. I'm usually about a year ahead. So, for example, I'm going to leave Tuesday for Nicaragua, and I'll be there for about seven weeks. So during that block of time, I concentrate on any tweaks for 2016 blends that there may or may not need to be, and really all the fact-finding to start for 2017. And anything I play with that I think you know has a chance or has something I can learn from, I lay down. And that was the batch that he had only a prior year ago. Mm -hmm. um, or I guess earlier in this year that I was and already which playing Which factory with is the, the H-Town Lancero made in? The H-Town's uh, Tobacco Layer L&V, which is a small factory in Tamboril that I was introduced to. It's where I did my first original cigar. Uh, it's also where I've done the Connecticut Fuerte. Um, very small, uh, but and that's, just that's very... Dominican, right? Yeah, and just very boutique-oriented. Very, you know, um, it's the one where when I when I was kind of being looking at some other factories and I wanted to bring a uh, a draw test machine... And, um, you know, Victor said to me, he says, well, do you have problems with the draw? And I'm like, no. He says, well, do you have problems with the construction? I'm like, no. He says, what the hell do I need the machine for? Uh, and in the most respectful way, but he's like, he was right. And he's just one of those people that, you know, can see it and feel it and know exactly what it is. So, um, you know, I, I could probably get some better pricing elsewhere, but I'm, I, don't, I'm not, I really don't want to give up that, that quality and that feel of that factory that it's, it's not giant. It's, it's small, but it's very boutique. And putting some neat stuff out of there. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the San Andreas has grown in Mexico, correct? That's correct. So, at, at, which, at which point do they take it into the factory in the Dominican? Is it during the curing phase? Is it during fermentation? It's, it's already <laughs> fermented at that okay. point. So, yeah. So, they're basically, um, they've got some very good contacts. And um, actually, I wasn't even looking at doing it there. And I had mentioned to him that I was looking, I was... Uh, playing with San Andreas, and, and he says, and, and it wasn't even on my radar to do in DR. And he says, oh, I've got some, you know, access to some really good San Andreas. And I'm like, well, you know, bring it in. Let's take a look at it. So they brought it in, like, the next day or the day after. And um, I was like, wow, this is, like, really, really good stuff. So, um, you know, let's, let's see what we can do. 
That's that's pretty cool. Do they ferment it more once they get it into the the factory in the Dominican, or is like I'm told no, the, the fermentation process is different for every single factory in in the whole world, right? Yeah, I mean the stuff that they do. This was the wrapper was not something that they were concentrating on the fermentation. I mean they have the obviously the other tobacco and things like that, but this was one that since it was a special situation for what what, what I was trying to put out of there, this was something that they had to go to somebody that they knew that was doing it and doing it in the way that that was going to be higher quality. Mm. Excellent, excellent. Will, sorry, I've been kind of stealing the show here. Uh, questions for Fred? I know you've got some prepared that you yep. really want to ask Fred. So yeah. So, Fred, I remember when you were on the Lost episode, right? Um, Will, are you part- sponsored by Bovita, by the way? Yes, we are, actually. That is, like, an amazing product. Quick shout-out to Bovita, that, um, an amazing product. Sorry, I saw the little things on there, and um, that is, like, the coolest invention for travel humidors. Anybody listening to the show not, uh, not using those in your travel humidors or even in a desktop humidor, you're absolutely nuts. Okay, back to the show. Yep, and, and just another <laughs> plug as long as you did that, Fred. Uh, we got Bovita confirmed on the show January 14th. Nice. Oh, so, good. Uh, we, good. Yep, yeah, so I was pretty excited yeah. about and that. And we're going to talk more about how we use Bovita because it's not just in our travel humidors or desktops either. So yeah. we've got some yep. interesting use, use cases for it. Yep. Ooh, now I'm intrigued. Yeah. But, so, Fred, I remember the lost episode. Um, one thing I was kind of saying that was missing from your portfolio was Maduro. Mm-hmm. And yes. I kind of got the, I kind of got the sense. Well, you you had told me I remember the answer. You said you know you felt there was a point that you weren't. You felt you had to get to the point where you were ready to work with Maduro. And yes. now since then, obviously you not only released the um, the H Town, but you have a regular production offering in the therapy call you know the therapy Maduro. So take us a little through now. Obviously you've made that jump into the Maduro space. What was that like? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think at the time that we were talking on there, um, it's just an adjustment of the palate. And and for me, I mean, you know, I, I can't, I usually have a goal and I have a set of tobaccos that I want to play with. Um, so at the time when we talked and, and there was a lot of, you know, people go, hey, how about a Maduro, something fuller, you know, and then, you know, the closest I got at the time was the C276, which has the Habano Oscuro on it, which I, I think is an amazing blend. But, you know, there, there's a level of meatiness and earthiness to a Maduro. And what I didn't want was a Maduro that just, you know, you have this incredibly strong cigar for, for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Um, the Maduros that I appreciate as a consumer are the ones that have that sweetness to it, that have that oily residue to it. Um, you know, a Maduro doesn't necessarily mean through the roof strong. And, and so if it is a through the roof strong cigar, um, it doesn't need to even be need to be a good blend because if you just blend one stupid strong and you stuff a little Lajero, it doesn't even have to be a good blend because the strength just covers everything up. It's like it's like putting ketchup all over everything. Mm. So um, so it was just you know back then that was one of the tobaccos I was still playing with. But the idea of blending or trying to choose what would fit into my palate for my portfolio, uh, it wasn't it wasn't there at the time. So then it was just a matter of smoking a lot more Maduros being able to ask the right questions of what type of Maduros I wanted to play with and things like that. So um, it, was, it, was, it was interesting. It was, it was very, very interesting. You, and you went, with, you went with the Pennsylvania Broadleaf with that therapy Maduro. And, and I hear mixed things about Pennsylvania Broadleaf, but I find the factories that are really good with it just are really good with it. And, and, and A.J. Fernandez's factory is one of them that knows how to work with that wrapper. Um, I yeah, I, great, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I mean, Pennsylvania was not my choice. I mean, I was like, I'm like, you know, I was literally looking at Connecticut and everything else. And um, AJ's the one that said, you know, really, you should look at the Pennsylvania Broadleaf. And that's when I kind of gave it a second look and also to see what, what the quality of it. Like I said, that's what's important about picking the right people to work with. Uh, and then when I tried it, because I was kind of chasing this little bit of sweetness, um, it's more of a tender, tender, subtle of a Maduro, I think, uh, and and it was, you know, it, it ended up being the right leaf to to point me towards because I really, I really, uh, I really am happy with it. Was that the first? And I kind of followed your blends. Was that is was that the first time you ventured not using an Ecuadorian wrapper? You know, um, I'm starting to get a little more bold. Um, most of my blends, you're absolutely right. Most of them have been centraled around an Ecuadorian wrapper. Um, certainly the Habano is, is a very classic. Um, it's a very familiar flavor. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an easy one for me to kind of figure out what, 
you know, based on everything, based on the binder filler, it's easy for me to figure out where it's going to end up. So it was really just a matter of getting outside the comfort zone, which is really what the Maduro was, Pennsylvania Raleigh was really what the San Andreas was. Um, the project that we're working on right now is probably going to be another San Andreas. It won't, most likely will not be the same blend as the Lancero. Um, I'm almost positive it won't at this point, to be honest with you. But um, uh, it, it's just it's 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 just a fun, it's a fun process learning that and going through it. So when when I read actually the press release this morning on the H Town, you, you said that was your tenth blend you've released. Um, yeah. Which I which yeah. I kind of looked at and it was an amazing amazing thing. Now, Fred, you and I had a really good conversation in Chattanooga, and it was probably if I had a look at conversations I had with folks. It was probably one of the ones that really stuck with me for 2015. And you talked about how the consumer base has gone from being blend blend loyal to brand loyal. Yeah, I mean the marketing the the marketing side of me is is looking at a couple things in the industry and trying to figure out how to stay ahead of it but yet not sacrifice what we want or not want to do. So what what I what I see is that is exactly that what you and I talked about is that you know there's that pressure for what's new what's new um, so they're they're very they're very brand loyal is that you know the people that I know that smoke nomads and I appreciate each and every one of them um, even they're like well what do you got what do you got new I mean I'm smoking these and and then they get distracted um, I really believe that as a consumer and I'm a consumer first and foremost. I mean, we could really stop making cigars right now. I, I, I said um, the other day, I made a comment at, at a seminar or something, and I said, you know, because the answer I get is like, oh, you know, people are coming out with these new and wild things and really cool. And I thought, you know, I would bet if I put together a panel of 12 people way smarter than me, way better palates, any cigar that we could come up with and say, oh, my God, so-and-so made this, there's nothing like it, those people could probably name two or three other cigars that were damn close enough. Um, and, and the pressure to put out, you know, so I'm looking at now is, you know, what's the lifespan of a new blend? And it may be only 16 to 18 months right now because the core line stuff becomes difficult. So if I look at my portfolio, so the H town was my 10th blend, um, counting the one LE that I did the H town, I'll put off to the side because it's a store exclusive. Uh, I'll tell, I'll take out, toss out the, um, toss out the, uh, LE that I did. Cause obviously it's sold out. And I look at, well, what's a core part of my portfolio? And I've done this, by the way, looking at other, at other manufacturers. I look at the Connecticut Fuerte as a core part of my line that probably does not need to go anywhere anytime soon because um, it, it fills a specific niche. Uh, I look at the 307, the S307, which is the box press Sumatra, which whether it fits that niche or not, it's a great aged cigar, but it's one that I'm going to have to let sunset when I run out of it because it's aged so well if I go back to the blending table, I won't be able to recreate it perfectly to the way it is right now. So it would be a disservice to the consumer. So I'd have to let it go. And then I look at something like the C276 or even the therapy line and I start to wonder, you know, what what is that pressure right now? You look at companies like Crown Heads and stuff that I think adapted very, very well to the current market. But like I said, they become brand loyal, not blend loyal. Even though they love the cigar and it's a great cigar, they're like always walking and going, well, what's new? What's new? And they want, they not only want something new in the humidor, they really want something new from the brand that they've identified with mm. or that they've enjoyed. Or in my case, they've enjoyed my journey from starting here to ending up here, but they still want something new on the way. And it's incredible pressure from, from a manufacturer standpoint um, not to come up with new blends, because I have to say that that process is getting easier. I understand now why people, manufacturers, have to go. Wow, I, you know, I've got these six blends that I love, but I got to pick one or two to go with this year. I understand because we, you know, it, it's like it's. I imagine it's like a cook. It's like you know, they only have only have one entree. They come up with all of a sudden like fifty entrees, and it's like you know, they they got, they got a whole menu of things. We can't do that. But when I look at the lifespan, it's like okay, so if I do a new product. There's certain marketing behind that. There's bands just for that product. There's UPCs just for that product. There's new boxes, and you don't really get economy of scale until such time that you've gone through enough production runs on it to make it worthwhile. So you print the bands once, and you print up 250,000 bands or whatever. But if all of a sudden you're having to flip through, particularly in the boutique world, at 50,000, 80,000, 100,000, and now you have to have a new blend, you're starting that process all over again. So it's a lot of pressure both on getting, coming up with new blends, but it's also a lot of pressure economically and not getting that economy of scale 
of a blend getting enough traction and staying along, uh, around long enough, particularly when people are still discovering your brand. Fred, I was uh, last week I interviewed uh, Jorge uh, Mon- Amateros. Mon- Amateros. Thank you, Will. Jorge Amateros from Tobacconist University. And he said something that was really interesting. And I was really trying to dig into the different types of tobacco. And he totally trumped me with his knowledge. And he said, Paul, look, there are lots of different types of tobacco. But inside of all those different types of tobacco, you may have two farms in the same region growing the same type of tobacco. However, when you smoke them, when it comes out of fermentation, they're totally different. So you mentioned before you liked Ecuadorian Habano, and you could have Ecuadorian Habano grown on two different farms in very much the same region, but they taste very different. And how does that play into um, what you've tasted, and do you agree with that? And also a, a kind of a follow-on question, you know, does that play into brand loyalty rather than blend loyalty? I mean, I like Ecuadorian Habano, but, you know, I really like it from this other manufacturer mm-hmm. because it's really good. And when I... Smoking from this other manufacturer, it's not quite to my palate. And does it kind of speak to Jorge's point? Yeah, I think that's I think that's a very good point. I mean, I would the example I use and I actually talk about in the blending seminar is that we talk about like Jalapa, we talk about Nicaragua, and we talk about the volcanic range. Mm-hmm. And so you can have two guys growing the same tobacco, but their fields were a slightly different soil makeup because they were fed from different volcanoes that pulled up lava from different depths. So, you know, forgetting all the stuff of, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's a couple degrees warmer all year, maybe, maybe it, they get more sun, you know, an extra hour or two of sun a day or mm-hmm. whatever it may be. So um, in the beginning, that was not a consideration of mine whatsoever. I did not have the knowledge. I didn't have the ability. I didn't have the palate to even go, if I smoke both those, I'm like, well, they both taste like a lot, but to me, mm-hmm. you know. So um, now as I get more and more into it, I start to see that. Um, do I think that equates down to a bl- uh, brand loyal, not blend loyal? Um, it could. I mean, you know, we we all play to a signature somewhat. I'm still trying to figure out what mine is. But, you know, I mean, it's why you could say, look, I mean, I like just about anything this guy puts out, and I hate just about anything that this guy puts out. Um, so they're just, you, you know, I think we end up gravitating towards the manufacturers that fit our palate. I'm always putting out a cigar I like, and then by default, if you've if you've enjoyed three quarters of the journey of the cigars I've created, by default, you're probably going to enjoy the other ones I create too because there's a certain similarity there. Mm. Um, that said, you know there's a lot of guys out there. there. There's only a few brands that I say, man, I like everything they make. Um, there's a lot of them like, man, I like that one they did, and I don't, you know, this isn't my yeah. isn't in my wheelhouse. Um, but I think there's a certain amount of that, but I'm still learning that, that, you know, that, that little tiny idiosyncrasies of, you know, which farm and, and how is it fermented? Was it fermented at a warmer rate or a slightly cooler rate? So it mm-hmm. took longer, um, man, I'll tell you the variables will like, you know, will, will, will mm-hmm. make you crazy. You yeah. Know, Jorge and I were talking about that last yeah. week too, that the variables are insane. You know, he was talking about he was on a farm and with a, a master blender and they were looking at like two different fields on the same farm. And one leaf was a little greener than the other leaf. And the blender was like, oh, we need to, you know, add some more nitrogen, some more fertilizer mm-hmm. to this soil. And Horace is like, dude, to me, they both look green, dude. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what he, but they just, they've got a method. And that's in the growing process. And there's a ton more stuff that you can do in the fermentation and curing processes that happen afterwards as well. So it's, it's yeah, and fascinating. I, I, would, I would say that's, that's not my strength. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a farmer. I'm not a grower. Um, I have a palate that I'm like, okay, you're telling me this tobacco is going to be slightly different. This one, cause of these, these variables. Mm-hmm. Okay. Just let me taste it. Just right. let me, just right. let me taste and see if I like the characteristics. So, um, I, I'm learning more of that by default. Do I care about <clears> that? <throat> yes. Because then I'm able to ask the right questions if I'm trying to chase something on a specific tobacco, but from a 30,000 foot level, Mm-hmm. I just need to know enough to ask for that tobacco to be at the table to play with. And then I'm all about the blending and going, what does this taste like? What does it taste like with this? Mm. Yeah. Because so that's it's more about that's taste, an, that's flavor, aroma. Yeah there's, yeah. there's so many aspects to it. It's, uh, it's fascinating. One thing that Paul and I have um, really, I think, this year on Stogie Geeks is we've really gotten into this theme of size matters. And one thing we're just, and this kind of, I guess, plays back into the, um, 
the blend versus brand loyalty is what we've discovered is really you owe it you know if you smoke a cigar from a from a new blend um and maybe you like it or you or don't like it you kind of owe it to really try another size because what we find is we've seen this a lot especially this year is that there's certain cigars we've picked up for the first time and we didn't care for it and then we went and picked up that same cigar same blend but in a different size oh absolutely and, yeah and it's and it's been an eye it's been an eye opener um uh, so i mean that that's just a comment i wanted to add in on there right just just like when we're at the shop that's a great point coop someone will come in whoever maybe uh fred's cigar whoever's cigar they'll ask me what vitola is the best one i, I it's not a sales pitch buy the whole line and you choose for yourself because I may like a Robusto, you may like a Corona or Lancero, whatever it happens to be. It's a great point. Yeah, I think I think you ask any manufacturer, and actually, I I had um, I had just tried one of somebody's recently, and um, you know, I sent them a text and said, you know, tried it, and they they sent back, oh, you got to try it in in this size because I think it's the best size. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of us will will be able to appoint to a size whether that's the size we originally blended to or that end up being our favorite, and we'll also have least favorite sizes in the blend. Mm -hmm. um, and I think size definitely matters. Mm -hmm. I think um, to Coop's point that you owe it yourself to try it in other sizes, um, I think that becomes particularly important if you're on the bubble and you're just like, you know, it's really good, you know, it was missing a few things, try it in another size, because that could make all the difference mm -hmm. in the world. You know, for me, um, I think it's a big remiss, and I'm not saying that just because we just did, you know, I have two Lanceros now, um, which, look, you're, you're not going to make a living off doing Lanceros. Um, there's just not enough smokers. But if you find a blend that you like and they happen to have a Lancero, which is rare to begin with, uh, you're really remiss not trying the Lancero or whatever blend, uh, trying, uh, you know, if, if they've got a, a, a 42, 44 ring gauge or, or a smaller cigar, because to me, you know, and I get it, it's a budget issue. You're looking at a Toro and a, and, a, and, a, and a small Corona and you're like, wow, for 50 cents more, I got the Toro, whatever it is. I get it. But um, if you're talking, talking pure out flavor or if you watch what the manufacturers or the blenders smoke, for the most part, with few exceptions, they're smoking smaller ring gauges. Uh, there's a couple I know that don't. There's a couple I know that love blending to bigger ring gauges. But for the most part, yeah, you definitely want to try a couple different sizes in that blend because it does make a big difference despite – how you try to tweak it to accommodate a size, uh, it can taste a lot better or, in some cases, a lot worse. Fred, uh, Will had you down for playing cigar trivia. No, no, no. No, no. He needs to play. That's a mistake. He needs to play five questions. He's never done Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Good. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry about Good. that. Glad you clarified that. Yeah, yeah. I realized that we had Fred on twice, and we the first time we didn't have the five questions, and I think the second time I just – didn't ask the five questions. So we have to get Fred for five questions. Okay. I just, I need to know. I Hold on a second. I had, I had queued up the 20 questions. Sure you don't want to ask him the 20 questions? Okay. Well, so do, five's, we haven't asked five's a lot shorter. Five is a lot shorter, yes. Well, what's up to you? I mean, if you it's want to hit okay. <laughs> Size matters. I like five questions. <laughs> Size matters, but let's do the five. I, I am hopped up on so much cold medicine right now. I'm just going to make up answers anyway, so go for it. Well, th this is this is good because uh, that's what you're supposed five. to do on five questions. Are you ready to play five questions with Stoey Geeks, Fred? Oh gosh, yes, I am. All righty, three three <laughs> words to describe yourself. Uh boy, I'm already failing at this kind. <laughs> no, there's no. See, the, the nice part about these five questions, Don't Fred, think it out. there is no right or wrong answer. It's totally chill, dude. It, well, no, I we're really I loose with the rules. I mean, if you, you, okay. you want to hyphenate uh, words, we, we it's want totally them to qualify fine. Okay. for the montage, though. So that's that's right. Right. I'm going yeah. to say I'm fairly laid back. That's hyphened. That's one word. Okay, see, I see we're uh, pretty loose with these rules. Right. Fairly, I'm going to say adventurous. And gaseous. What? Who said oh. that? <laughs> what, what the? What the? Gaseous. Gaseous. Laid back, adventurous, and I really should have brought in like my wife or daughter to answer this. Um, you can phone a friend. Phone a friend. Yes, <laughs> you can phone a friend. We're gonna get the easy button. <laughs> <laughs> um, curious. There you go. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? A frozen ice pick. 
Mm, nice choice. No one asked that, answered that one before, yeah. I think. If you wrote a book I, about I yourself, played, what would the title be? I'm surprised my life... I'm surprised I'm this normal. I'm surprised I turned out this normal. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? I have played this game because I didn't know what that is, and I still don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's very popular in Europe. Uh, I'm going to say first. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Oh, that's a good one. That's a really good one. This is the tough one. Yes. Yes, it is. The dad usually comes easier because you're like, oh, yeah, I can. I can. But the then you think about the gets mom. gets into all sorts of Oedipal things. I'm going to yeah. go with. It's very Freudian. Glenn Close and Sean Connery. Wow. Very nice. Very wow. nice. Not the very dude? Nice. No. God, you would want to be his dad. You'd want to be like a weird <laughs> uncle. <laughs> he would make a good weird uncle. Yeah, was that your Halloween uncle. costume this year, Fred? Was the dude? It was. It was the dude, yeah. You did it nice. I liked it. Yeah, well, because, see, what I, I actually thought of it last year. So I went to a Halloween party last year, and I went as, as um, Hugh Hefner. So that was the plan. So I basically, I found like a 1950 smoking jacket, gorgeous jacket, put it on, had the slacks, got a pipe. I look in the mirror and I'm like, I'm not really Hugh Hefner. I'm more like the fat, bloated Steven Seagal. So, um, so that, that, that didn't work at all. So then I, then, so some, somehow I was going home from the party. I'm like, man, why couldn't I think of it? And I'm like, the dude, I'm like, that's perfect. So I grew the goatee out. I got the exact replica. I found the sweater he had from the show. I found the pants. I had everything. It was great. And it's like a totally laid back costume to like, you know, enjoy the, enjoy the night. Yeah. No, that's key. Mm. I, was a, I was a pimp this Halloween. <laughs> One sick pimp. Um, I'll tell you. It was, it was, it was <laughs> epic. Willie the pimp. Willie the pimp. Fred, nice. thank you very much for appearing on the Stoey Geek Show. It was wonderful having you back here on the show for oh, your third you, appearance. Yes, I love I, I, I love I love the show. You guys are doing an awesome job. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm like I said, I'm just kind of the guy that still trying to figure out how the hell I'm even allowed to do this. Um, but you know, I, I like I like watching the show because you know I'm I'm you know I've actually I'm trying to coin a new phrase that this guy gave me in a cigar shop because I hate the term uh, cigar aficionado, and he said. Uh, well, you're not, you know, and I told him I didn't like the term. He says, well, why don't you just go with, you know, cigar enthusianato? And I'm like, I like that term because I'm just term. enthusiastic. So when you guys have people on the show and stuff like that and I could watch, I can, I can kind of take off the hat of some dude that goes down there and blends cigars and has a good time to, man, I just, I just, I like those guys too. I like what they do. I mean, my favorite time, you know, like I, I loved it, you know, to go out and, and try, you know, Nick's new cigar and Saka's new cigar and everything mm -hmm. else like that. See what Dion has going. Um, so, you know, I, I, I enjoy that. I really enjoy the industry. So it's, it's great to see shows like this doing well, 165 episodes and, and all but one of them are gold. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> Fred, thank you very much. Thank you guys. Have a good night with that. We're going to take a short break, come back with Thanks. our debonair ideal segment for this evening. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 